It's a pleasure to meet you, and it's a thrill to be here, and I appreciate the need for people to stand up and move around and uh, as people trickle back in. Um, I just want to uh, thank Michael Thomas for his leadership of the New England Board of Higher Education. We've known each other for a good bit of time. I'm well aware of his uh, aspiration to, to help the New England post-secondary arena improve itself, and so thank you very much for your very hard work. And, for this conference, Michael, it's a thrill. I, I came to Michael through my own uh, uh, energies, I guess I should say, but it's, uh, it's, it's really Charlie Desmond, uh, whom I knew uh, many years before 9-11, but you know the people you were with that day? Uh, Charlie and I and a team of researchers and faculty leaders uh, were together in Washington, and uh, every year thereafter, we reflect on that amazing experience. So thank you, Charlie. Um, there are a lot of people in the audience whom I know and care about and from whom I have learned a lot. And uh, as I go along, I'll, I'll try to recognize them. There are uh, undoubtedly a couple people who passed through the State University of New York. So uh, you're my proof point. <laughs> you can ask them later, like Stephen right down here from Potsdam, uh, if what she said was true. Um, and Scott Jassick and I go round and round all the time. He asks a really tough questions. And uh, usually, I, I thought he was going to say this, I've never met a president who didn't say, uh, we do that. Uh, when you think about the role of president, is it's promotional. And I know there's several presidents in the audience uh, as well. And I just uh, find it somewhat humorous that we are so self-promoting that sometimes we just can't tell the truth. Uh, it's hard. <laughs> it's really hard. Um, but I will give Scott this shout out. There's a little article in Inside Higher Education today of a convening in New England. Uh, it was written by uh, Mary Churchill, whom I don't know, but she's at Salem State College. And uh, it begins with, it starts by listening. And what she was really applauding is that convening around and with our colleagues and listening to what they're doing is really the kind of learner-centered adults who serve our learner-centered universities need to do more of, and it was in, in high, Inside Higher Education today. Now, um, I uh, know that you've been sitting a while, and so with Darren's help, who was standing here but may now be up there running things, I've brought movies. I just want to keep you engaged right, right before lunch. And uh, I sort of took the liberty of, of renaming uh, this learner-centered uh, institution as something around the development of talent. Uh, later this week, Thursday and Friday, the State University of New York is sponsoring um, its fifth annual conference. We try to talk about something kind of edgy, and this year's topic is creating the new business model for the academy, colon, and it's always what's after the colon, partnerships, affiliations, mergers, and acquisitions. If that's not edgy enough, I wonder, <laughs> it might be career limiting too, I'm not sure. I uh, wonder what Jim Collins would say, he's not available actually, but uh, other change agents have been before us over the last four years and this year is no exception. Why it is we need to ask the question, are we a learner-centered institution? I mean, when you think about it, what else would we be? if we could use the words customer and client. So I'm going to uh, build a case for uh, this notion really presented by David Leonhardt several years ago, but it is now so totally in my DNA. Education, educating more people and educating them better is simply, I edit, the best bet any society can make. So that's my theme, and here we go. Um, I do read a lot of Jim Collins. I, I think it extraordinary that he had to write a whole appendix or uh, addendum to explain to all of us in the social sector that he didn't mean we had to look like Target or any other of the corporate uh, affiliations to think about greatness. Uh, what he said about these big, hairy, audacious 
goals is that we were more uh, disciplined. That is a central characteristic of greatness, not looking like a business. So uh, I just took one of his themes, this big, hairy, audacious goal, and I reflect on how important the Land Grant Act is for all of us. That is with President Justin Morrill. And I think we celebrated a few years ago the signing of the Land Grant Act, but think about how it has taught all of us about engagement. Think about the GI Bill and how important it was to educate our returning veterans and how important it continues to be. Think about the impact of the Pell Grants, even though there continues to be controversy about getting it just right. Every, so, uh, every once in a while, a President of the United States comes up with something so audacious and so aspirational that we have to pay attention. That was it. This is it. I am so proud to introduce you now, the President of the United States, Barack Obama. Well, it is good to be back in Buffalo. Good to be back in New York. And we've got all the students in the house. Thank all the students. Hello, Binghamton. A higher education is the single best investment you can make in your future. I'm excited because the great work that uh, SUNY campuses like Binghamton are doing to keep costs down for hardworking students like so many of you. We're going to be partnering with colleges to do more to keep costs down, and we're going to work with states to make higher education a higher priority in their budgets. Now, if we move forward on these three fronts, increasing value, encouraging innovation, helping people responsibly manage their debt, I guarantee you we will help more students afford college. It was a little self-promotional, but not totally so. <laughs> because this president, amongst recent presidents, has said more about higher education, post-secondary education, than any of his predecessors. In fact, I think if we continue the dialogue about free community college or free college, we will see this forefronted as it already is in the current presidential election. So what he was, of course, reminding us is that we have a ways to go. Twelfth in anything does not fit the United States of America, and he is in every fiber of his body trying to promote the role and talent development that college, post-secondary education, for traditional age students and for adults is simply the best bet any society can make. And others have widely, widely embraced this agenda. Some are here today. So between Arne Duncan and President Obama talking about accountability, talking about affordability, talking about access has been a central role for this administration. But my second uh, additional columnist from the New York Times, uh, Frank Bruni, talked to us uh, about this goal. The trouble with the goal is that we're not going to reach it. For the President of the United States, that goal was 60% of the adult population with a degree by 2020. Inchims thinks we might make it by 2037. Lumina's goal by 2025, a 50, a 2054 reality. Very, very troubling. I can see that this is a very sensitive um, clicker, because I, <laughs> it's not easy doing this. Um, Frank Bruni, uh, I think, really said what we're facing in this talent development, in this learner-centered environment. We must make college practical, but not excessively so, lower its price without lowering its standards, and increasing the number of diplomas attained without diminishing not only their currency in the job market, but also the fitness of the country's workforce. This, my friends, is troubling. And so, as the leader of a system, which is different from academic leadership in an individual campus, I think we need a solution that speaks to the scale of system. And so this is my third and last of these. I think Tom Friedman had it right. This is not, uh, 
his famous work, but this, I think, does say it all. If we're the smartest, if we're the most comprehensive, if we have the most post-secondary opportunities, then most countries around the world, we still need to work on getting our collective act together. So Adam is right. I want to talk about scale, because the Lumina report of the last six months about these two ambitious goals, President Obama's and Lumina's goal, we have moved the dial in six years toward degree completion by 2%. If we don't figure out how to get the collective actions of our 3,000 plus post-secondary institutions in this country, we're not going to get even to 11th, let alone our status as 12th. So uh, we need an idea. This is Skyline Chile. The reason I'm using it is because it makes five points. You got to have the spaghetti. You have to have the beef. You have to have the beans. You have to have the cheese. You have to have the onions to create Skyline Chili. I was with R.T. Ryback last week. He was the former mayor of Minneapolis, and he is now leading a cradle to career partnership in the Twin Cities. And he said this, and it's kind of homespun. People ask me, what is the single critical ingredient for completion? And his commonplace response back, what is the single most important, important ingredient for making a cake? Well, I really don't know because I really don't cook, but his point is well taken. I do know it's flour and sugar and eggs and vanilla and whatever else comes with it. So I want to pose, uh, using uh, SUNY as a case, what five critical ingredients are for taking education to scale. And more importantly, taking what works in education to scale. We did, under one president, create a thousand points of light. And we have succeeded. We have hundreds of thousands of points of light, but we cannot get ourselves focused on the evidence behind those strategies and how to take, and this is the key line, how to take evidence-based strategies to scale. So uh, the first of this theory is that we do need vision. Uh, I doubt there's an institution here without some stated vision for your aspirations as an institution. We've heard great examples today. For me, this is kind of what does the dog do when it catches the car? These are 64 very different, very individual, very idiosyncratic institutions. 17 of them are baccalaureate institutions, four of them are doctoral institutions, two are independent freestanding medical schools, 30 community colleges, seven technical colleges. What in the world do these institutions have in common? Well, like like you, I said I'd go visit the colleges. I failed to recognize that it was 64 widely distributed campuses across the totality of the state of New York, but in 95 days I did it and spent a half day at every campus, followed by statewide conversations, followed by sort of a documented convergence around our capacity to create economic development for our state and also to enhance the lives of every citizen. And that's not a bad goal for 2009. Think of where we were. But the fact is that we managed to translate that vision into what we could do for healthcare, for the environment, uh, for science, for engagement, for global attentiveness, and yes, what we could do for New York to seal the leaks in the education pipeline. And I will tell you, the education pipeline continues to leak like a sieve. Let's say 75% of our ninth graders do get a high school diploma. We're not even going to comment on whether they're college and career ready. But of those 73, 
only 51, half of the 109th graders who, who began that journey in high school will find it to a college three months later. Only 37 of those 109th graders will be sophomores. And one in five ninth graders in this country today will make it to the baccalaureate finish line in six years. We are leaking like a sieve. So we looked at this at SUNY. We beat the national average for four and six year graduation. We beat the national average for two year graduation, but we decided something you rarely hear. We are good, but we are not good enough. We have to do better. And I don't know that you need a number to do better, but as long as we're happy with 93,000 degrees issued every year, a big number, we can roll along. But when we decided, and I'll admit this, it wasn't the State of the Union, but it was the State of the, the University Address, and I did say I bet we could do a lot better, and I bet we could do a lot better in five years, heads turned, anxieties began, and we began to chase a very important number for degree completions. We know that will add to the economy of the state of New York. It will add to the pocketbook of our graduates. It will change the way we think about talent development in our state. But vision without action really doesn't amount to much. So as we build on this little analog of the skyline Chile, we started thinking about systemness. Now, this wasn't a word until Stephen Colbert started talking <laughs> about truthiness. And we decided if Stephen Colbert could make up a word, we could make up a word too. And so it still stands in Wikipedia. We don't know how long, but nobody's taken it down yet. And this is this notion that we could get these 64 cats herded in some kind of direction that would take what works to scale. And when you think about your own condition, you might be in the UMass system, that you might be in the main system, you might be an independent uh, operating on your own vision, but until we figure out how to get our work coordinated and convergent, we will not ever be able to make those ambitious goals that 60% of the adult population has a college degree? What are we gonna do with the other 40% if we don't turn this around? And uh, I thought systemness was it, and the whole is greater than the sum of the parts until I read these couple of dudes from Stanford who wrote in the Stanford Social Innovation Newsletter about collective impact, which has its own theory of action about how to move the dial. Not only did they, uh, Lucy Lepofsky, talk about Strive Together, which is a cradle to career initiative in Cincinnati, they talked about bringing the number of teenage pregnancies down. They talked about enhancing water quality in transportation. Multiple examples of how if we can find a way to work together, we can move the dial. We can get the right stakeholders at the table not random, but together moving the same ambitious goal. We can identify shared goals out of which we can create evidence-based strategies. I heard a lot of strategies today, but our obligation is to know why they work, how they work, and how they work at scale. And that takes the kind of leadership that the New England Board of Higher Education can offer, that systems can offer, that states can offer, that this country can offer. So uh, we passed right over beans, I think it was, but I, I wanted to say that I think in a way to meet our ambitions around learner-centered talent development completion we have to sort of simplify the standard. We are so many different things on our campus, so many different programs and projects and institutes and academies that what we tried to do to seal the leaks in the education pipeline, which came from our strategic vision, and turn it into strategic action, we are using this formula. We are limiting 
the number of evidence-based strategies that we are going to pursue as a system. Around our access continuum, we've always been for standing for access, we will continue to do so. Around degree completion, uh, and we're taking book on that and also setting this very ambitious goal of 150,000 degrees completed by 2020. And we are adding a variable because we think that talent development depends not only on degree completion, but what happens next. So I thought I would provide one example in each of these categories. I thought I was going to talk about our cradle to career work, but if I did that, I would run out of time. So I'm really going to talk about early college high schools. I haven't heard anybody today acknowledge how profoundly important it is to start early, not in grade 13. PTAC is that it offers students an opportunity to get their high school diploma, but also their college level courses. The beauty of the PTAC program, which is what enticed me, was we have two periods that are project-based learning, and it allows us to tie it all together, to take a project and see the connections to science, math, English, and so forth. We all had an interest in like technology and uh, editing and coding, and I hope that this school can like bring that to me. Try to focus more on the interaction aspect, allowing students to have conversations on their own. And I always begin my class by reminding the students, you know, questions that I ask and opinions that I offer are not necessarily my own, and I'm not trying to get you to think one way. I'm trying to get you to think a different way than you are. And it doesn't seem like you're learning, but you are, and you progress every day. With our business partners and mentors, it allows the students to see a wide variety of fields, a wide variety of occupations, and hands-on see what it's about. Do I like it? Do I want to pursue this? E-Tech is the opportunity, the bridge to the future. I have too many choices. The most rewarding part about that is when the kids come to you and say, I am so glad I'm here. I see the benefits of this program. I'm going to graduate with an associate degree and or a job. The students are understanding what it means to be a high school slash college level student. And one of the most exciting things is to see that growth and to try to project how that growth will continue to expand in the coming months and the coming years. PTEC is uh, just one of a set of examples of early college high schools in New York State, of which we have about 50. The first one began, the first PTEC began in Brooklyn, as Donna well knows, uh, and is now spreading across the state, across the country, and around the world, uh, a little ahead, I might say, of the clear uh, theory of action that we can profoundly test, but we are madly collecting data to see if we can't get a breakthrough sense of why starting kids early, grade nine in this case, and keeping them engaged through their associate degree is one evidence-based strategy that over time we can scale across the state and, and quite frankly, uh, across the nation. Under completion, I have a couple of examples and I'm gonna forewarn Darren that um, I'm going to skip the first one, uh, but I can tell it to you, so I'll push the button Roll the video. I was an art major. And then move on. Uh, and here's why. We are piloting Quantway Statway, which is a Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching, Rapid Prototyping Intervention for Math uh, Statistics at the community college level. We at SUNY spend about $70 million on remediation. Our students spend about $90 million a year to buy credit that will not ensure degree calculation and, and graduation. So we are intervening at the mega level and already have 15 community colleges 
piloting Quantway Statway, collecting data all the way to see how this works, but we know what we know from this concept of rapid prototyping, which I think would work for many of the examples here today, is that students uh, are twice well prepared for college math in half the time. Not a bad wager. Hopefully, early college high schools will help us eradicate math remediation in our lifetime, but for those we didn't catch, we're going to catch them with Quantway Statway. And the other completion tool that we are heavily betting on, I would say, is our online initiative called Open SUNY. supports and experiences along the way that helps them complete a degree and open career opportunities. The world has changed too. With today's technology, online education is more flexible and effective than ever and can reach and engage learners on their terms. Across the nation, other universities are moving aggressively to address the rapidly growing potential and promise of online education. Fortunately, SUNY is positioned well to raise its aspirations to provide high-quality online-enabled education. We cannot miss the opportunity to come together to shape online education for tomorrow. Some SUNY institutions are already tackling the challenge and are well-positioned to provide a high-quality online education. Imagine what we can achieve if we come together making the most of the heritage and aspirations of each institution. Imagine if more students graduated because we used online education to help crack the completion code for students. Imagine if prospective students could easily find the online SUNY program that is right for them. Imagine if every New Yorker had access to a high quality, affordable SUNY degree, regardless of where they live or their ability to be on a campus. Will you open the doors to expanding student access? Will you open opportunities for students to complete their education? Will you open the potential for students to succeed? Will you open SUNY? One of the things that has been most enlightening about our attempt to expand our online uh, offerings uh, to over 100,000 students is what we call the digital DNA. The faculty development, the excellence, the data, the availability, understanding how to enroll online. And we're pretty sure that if students have the opportunity to fill in the campus completion portfolio with courses offered at any one of our 64 campuses, they will bring down the cost of their college degree as well. So it's a completion strategy, it's a financial savings strategy, it's a recognition of the hybrid nature of online and residential learning, all wrapped up in a very ambitious uh, opportunity to extend our online programs to all New Yorkers. And then thirdly, to reach this ambitious goal of talent development, We've added, as I said, a success element. Uh, and the best illustration of this success element probably comes from John Dewey, learning by doing. And so, as you would expect, in an institution that is system-wide, our goal is to provide for every SUNY student an applied learning opportunity, an applied learning opportunity in work, or in community engagement, or in international travel, or in the research laboratory, or even in the on-campus work responsibility. 
And uh, thanks to the help of the uh, World Association of Cooperative Education, and Paul Stoneley is going to be with you this afternoon, we are trying our darndest to take that applied learning opportunity to every student at SUNY, including an online, I would call it, dating system, where we connect the faculty member, the student, and the receiver, be it government or business and industry or the social sector, so that we can ensure this kind of experience for all of our SUNY students. It's a tough job market, and without experience, it's hard to find a position right out of college anywhere. I've been working for two months, and I've learned so much more than I could ever have thought. What COOP allows you to do is take the questions and topics that you learned in school and find out how they apply to the real world. I'm going to stay on as a, on a project by project basis, but it seems also, again, like an opportunity I can't pass up. Uh, we treat our co-ops as employees. We really plug them right into the team. They have responsibilities within the groups. The people that we've had join us are technically excellent. They are highly marketable and will be very relevant in the marketplace and they've been a tremendous asset to us. Students returning from professional experience uh, enrich the classroom by uh, bringing that experience to the classroom. Employers benefit from co-op relationships because we're able to fill gaps in our staffing challenges. I strongly encourage my students to consider cooperative experience because it will enable them to see how the things that they're learning in college will apply directly in a job. In my case, I was fortunate enough in that I was offered a full-time position after my, after my uh, appointment. I think one of the best benefits to co-ops is that they make connections with people who work in the industry that they would like to work in. So we have driving this uh, completion agenda uh, a performance management system. There are exactly 17 metrics that we agreed we would chase at SUNY. I don't know why it couldn't be 15, but I know what it couldn't be was the 200 we started with. So over two years, with immense engagement of our faculty, our students, our staff, uh, our larger community, we have a set of metrics for access, a set of metrics for completion, a set of metrics for success. Uh, lest you think I don't work in the purview of research university engagement uh, and inquiry. Uh, these are the five buckets of success and excellence that we are chasing. And on October 21st, which was just last Thursday, every one of our 64 campuses submitted their version of this matrix based on the unique individuality of each of our 64 campuses. And we will be publicly sending results from this assessment system, not only to our Board of Trustees, but frankly, to our governor. And in cracking the code to 150,000 degrees, 60,000 more than we are currently operating, we took the engineer's approach to where we would get those 60,000 students, some from just graduating the students we have, some from expanding access, some from open SUNY, uh, some from uh, uh, other interventions that we are learning from other campuses. To sustain our work, the governor has invested in uh, this 150,000 uh, graduates promise. I kind of think that giving the state a number sort of boiled down what their responsibility was and what our responsibility was. We matched the governor's $18 million with a repurposing of about $80 million of our own money. As people said, we're not going to get a lot of new money, not enough by itself, so we have to repurpose and reallocate. We had a $100 million fund, which several months ago we asked for uh, proposals and white papers. We ended up getting 211 proposals for taking what works to scale for sharing with other campuses. Uh, and even though we can't fund all of them because the total figure came to $489 million instead of the $100 million that we have, this is a system trying to be the best at getting better. I think there is some secret sauce. Uh, I think part of it is we've stopped this madness 
reported or cartooned in the Albuquerque Journal, whatever, we've quit blaming K-12 because we prepare the teachers who teach the kids who come to college ready or not. So it's our challenge too. We have gathered significant stakeholders. These are the Knights of the Round Table. They are not our presidents, but we've worked really hard at bringing our presidents to the table, our faculty governance leaders, of which we have 64, our student assembly leaders, of which we have 64, our uh, community colleges within those uh, sectors, to, to own a common vision and a common set of metrics and a common goal. We know that that goal requires great attentiveness and that we have to ferret out what we don't know enough about to take to scale. Um, foundations have been provocative in this regard because they've funded a lot of things that in many cases aren't evidence-based. Uh, some have called this spray and pray. Uh, and I think that's a little bit like what we've done. I think that if you go home and you think about all the active interventions on your campus to reach this compelling goal of completion and ferret out which ones have evidence, data that shows they work, very impressive, ASAP. Now the question is how to take what they now know works to scale. Um, this is not cheating. Um, this is learning from each other, getting out of our own internal silos to find out what's working down the street and be willing, which is incredibly courageous, to try something you didn't invent. It's anomaly in many respects, but it is the work that has to be done if we're going to get our state legislators our federal government to take us at our word that we can grow back to be first in the world because we know how to act collectively, we know that access is critical, we know that we can increase completions, and we can successfully translate a degree completion to advanced study and a promising career. And as Tom Friedman would say, we're that close. If we can do this, no one can stop us, but we have to find the way to work more effectively together. Thank you. I am. Um, in my own logic, and you are guilty of this as well, I try to say too much. Therefore, you have four minutes to pose that most compelling question, uh, or not. Um, but I'm, I'm available if you want to step up to the mic. I wanted to say, while I'm waiting for someone, that at SUNY we have 166 roller-like groups you know what a role like group? This is when the provosts convene, the presidents convene, the CAOs, the CIOs, the student affairs, 166. So I want to reduce that to five, and people are saying, well, but that's how SUNY works. It works in that sort of stratified role alike effort to be the best at getting better. So I would challenge you that we've got to find those role alike groups. We've got to learn from each other. But I think we've also got to have more conversations about the collective good and sharing data. Um, what was it? Inclu uh, intrusive uh, data analytics. Uh, I'm sort of following. We are following the lead of the Carnegie Foundation for the Advancement of Teaching and their continuous improvement model and the design of continuous improvement networks where you start every meeting with the data. Trust me, it will change the conversation. It will take it out of personality-driven decision-making 
or fiefdom-driven decision-making or rank decision-making into, gee, really? We had 75% of the high school graduates saying they were going to go to college in three months. And when we looked at the data, only 40% made it. What happened? Yeah. Hi, I'm Sharon Hardy, and I'm from IntelliDapt, which is a startup um, ed tech company looking at helping retention, especially in the STEM subjects. And my question is, uh, by focusing in on metrics, and I have worked in higher ed too, so I, I know the fiefdom model and all that, um, and the fact that faculty are a lot like cats, and, and or why the term was coined, herding cats. Um, anyway, how do you avoid uh, focusing on the numbers and not seeing, or, or in monitoring that the quality is not getting diluted? Because we can all imagine that there'll be incentives for people to fudge the numbers. Or for, you know, well, let's just throw up the lowest score that everybody gets, or something of that nature. Well, I have to say that this is the number one conversation we have every time the faculty convene. In fact, a week ago, it wasn't even pretty. It was, um, you are watering down quality by setting an ambitious completion agenda. Well, A, quality begins and ends with the faculty and their ability to deliver, and I trust that that is a primary goal of the faculty. I was speaking to the faculty council for our community colleges. Second, I think the quality argument is incredibly elusive. So I asked the faculty council of community colleges, and then again the faculty council for our four-year institutions to come together this year and give us a framework for quality. We use proxies in, in lots of other things we do. Counting citations is a proxy for quality research. Counting publications is a proxy. Now we love the way we evaluate research. And someone said earlier, we don't have enough proxies for quality teaching and learning. So give us a definition of quality that we can describe, measure quantitatively, qualitatively, and then let's move on. The numbers in the metrics are just some standard that we have to start with. But I would challenge every faculty convening on the planet to find some level of agreement around what quality means, because otherwise, it's kind of a, you don't know what to make of it. Is it contrary? Is it a pushback? Is it a trust issue? What is it? Hi. Well, I love this being the best at getting better. And you know where we stole it from? Hospitals. Hospitals are in a major transformation. Uh, I think that's really where continuous improvement, the Carnegie Foundation started. And they're so open about getting better and they take a slice of a skill. It, it could be catheters, it could be any of the zillions of uh, insurance-based <laughs> reimbursement. Those things that go on regularly in high schools, in, in hospitals, and they break it down and they examine it, and most recently they form networks so that multiple hospitals come together to look at catheter placement or whatever, and they come back three different times. You've got to read about this. This is a cycle of continuous improvement that I think has eluded our sector for far too long. And even though we may be critical of healthcare, they could teach us a lot. And again, Lucy Lepofsky, Children's Hospital in Cincinnati, Ohio, is working with the Cradle to Career Network to teach us how to use continuous improvement. Or go to Menominee Falls High School in Milwaukee and just watch them do it. It is amazing. Yes. Hi, my name is Eve Solomon Fernandez, and I'm the interim president at Mass Bay Community College. I don't have a question. I simply wanted to say this was a, an exceptional presentation, and I'm very impressed with the way that, given your large system in New York, you're able to coordinate all of these activities, all of these initiatives towards increasing uh, student success and also for 
uh, raising the academic rigor, academic excellence, everything, um, and your just your overall approach towards uh, working with faculty and seeing that whether your faculty or administrator, someone spoke to the false dichotomy earlier, that we are all working towards the same common goals. I just want to say this was just exceptional. I really well, enjoyed it. Thank you. I, um, that is a good note to end with, right? I will tell you that in these state of the university addresses, which I created mostly to sort of have an open letter to the governor, <laughs> It, it, there's plenty of room. It's not standing room only, and you're welcome. Um, and we try to put some edgy stuff in those speeches as well to keep us going. The most freeing thing I think I've said in five years of these State of the University addresses, we're good, but we're not good enough. And trying to be the best at getting better is the most freeing thing that has happened to me in 40 years of academic life. Thank you very much.